All right, so uh, we are uh, beginning, we have been beginning and working through some of the Psalms, not all the Psalms, but just a few of them for a few weeks here uh, at the end of the year. Uh, I just felt uh, impressed to do that. And so tonight we're going to look at Psalm number 42 and 43. These two Psalms are very similar to each other. They're like a, a combination of the same message. In fact, they end with the same refrain. Uh, at the end of each one of them so and it's dealing with discouragement and you know I think sometimes we take for granted that being a Christian means you're never going to have to have to deal with discouragement or uh, it kind of I, I just kind of I kind of call it a downer day you know downer day sometimes when um, you begin to feel like um, things aren't going the way you've been praying and you're seeking God and you don't see those things coming to pass exactly the way you want to. And if we're not really uh, focused where we need to be and really allowing God to do what only he can do and start trying to fix things by our own power, because that's what you do when you get discouraged. You start trying to figure out a way to help yourself, uh, which never works uh, unless you're led by God to do something. Of course, he, he can give you guidance and direction. And I do believe sometimes there are reasons for discouragement that we might uh, might need to check into as far as like our physical our physical body. Sometimes we uh, we might overeat on certain things, and the next thing you know, we kind of got a down and day. We don't understand why. It's because we loaded up on donuts and uh, all those kind of things for a whole day, and then we feel miserable about it. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, it doesn't just have to be donuts, but you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes we can kick ourselves into one of those times uh, and then, then sometimes we get our focus off of Jesus and we get it on ourselves and we get all bound up in things people are doing and uh, things are happening around us and we get all into that and next thing you know we're acting like them because we're, we're letting ourselves go down instead of keeping our eyes where they're supposed to be. Really uh, the Bible teaches us, I, I remember just, just to let you know something that happened to me years ago. Most of you know that I had trigeminal neuralgia, and trust me, if you don't, that's a big name, I know, but trust me, it's it's pain like the closest thing to, I don't know what, it's horrible. Hardest pain to deal with that I know of. Huh? It's worse than shingles, honey. It is worse than shingles, trust me, I've had both, I know. But I couldn't talk, I couldn't move my mouth or it triggered the pain. And I went to church one day, and uh, I wasn't smiling on purpose. <laughs> Trust me, it had nothing to do with my spiritual being. So sometimes you don't need to judge people by what they look like. And one of the sainted ladies walked up to me and said, Sister Allen, if you lose your joy, you'll lose your strength. <laughs> well, I, I would have slapped her. If I, <laughs> that's really what I felt like doing because I, I was not moving my mouth because I didn't want to hurt. <laughs> So we don't know why the reasons are, but if we're not, you know, and during that time in my life, it was a real battle that I really did get discouraged and kind of hurt at God because I didn't find an instant answer. God didn't heal me. God didn't heal me the way I thought he should heal me. And so I, I prayed and saw the face of God. I went and I went down to Baton Rouge, thought maybe they could pray for me better than we could pray. Y'all could pray for me here in Natchitoches. And I got disappointed there too. I remember... Uh, I remember I went down to the uh, front of the uh, front of the church to speak to Brother um, Branko, I believe it was, because uh, he asked me to tell him hello, and I hadn't been talking during church, but when I started to speak to him, suddenly the pain started, and I never showed it. I just, I just endured it, and I stood there. So I ran outside and went into a little cubby, cubby, cubby hole that goes into the doors on one of the doors they didn't use. And I stood out there and, and beat my fists on the bricks, screaming with pain, crying, tears pouring out of my eyes. And I know what it is to feel that way. So I'm telling you this story not to make you feel sorry for me, but, but to make you understand that I know what it's like to feel that way. At that time, I was pretty much into the word of faith stuff, and I just didn't, didn't understand. You know, I thought if I did everything right, if I did everything right, God ought to do it right too. You know, I was I was in that kind of uh, understanding. I was in that place, and so I became pretty hurt at God before I got through all that. And it was a dark, dark hour in my life 
uh, that, that only God could have gotten me out of. And I'm so thankful to tell you that God is faithful. And when you are going through these things, just know that God is faithful. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. There really is light at the end of the tunnel. And if you'll wait on God, if you'll wait on God in your trouble. You know, I did not wait on God. I got a little hurt at God, and then I made a choice to go to a doctor who did a procedure that was extremely excruciating, and it was a wrong decision. Because I didn't, because I eliminated God choosing me a doctor. You understand? I eliminated that because doctors were outside the spectrum of God. You understand what I'm saying? So I eliminated the doctor thought, and I just said, well, I'm just going to go to a doctor, and I just went to somebody I shouldn't have gone to. And consequently, I had the first uh, procedure done that was not, in fact, the second doctor told me I shouldn't have had that done. So I ended up with three surgeries. Instead of waiting on God and following God in the, in the storm, that's what I want to say to you tonight. When you're in the storm, don't give up on following God. Don't get so discouraged you try to make another way and just say, well, God, you're not going to do it, so I'll take over. And that's what I did. But, you know, there was a day when God sent me down the right path and to another doctor, and he, and he led me to a doctor then. And I'm so thankful uh, that he did because God worked it all out. But uh, because of that, I do have some issues, and most of you know about that too. So when you're eating lunch with me, just know that when... I'm slobbering, it's because I can't feel anything on my left hand, left side of my face. So <laughs> sometimes, uh, you know, I look a little funny. So I want to I want to look at this, and, and in the uh, in the forty second chapter, uh, let me see if I'm in the right place. That doesn't look right. Let me go over here. Okay. Uh, let me see. That's not the right one. I don't know where I'm doing here. I thought, oh, here it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I'm crazy. Talk so much I got myself off track. Okay, here we go. The first part of this chapter is something that you uh, have heard many times. As the deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now listen to this. He says, my tears have been my meat day and night. Now, I know that these, point, these poems, these songs actually point to Jesus. And we know that in his suffering, trust me, he knows what your suffering is when you're going through suffering. Because the suffering he bore on the cross is the most horrendous suffering anybody could have borne. And so these words where it says, my tears have been my meat day and night, he knew what he was talking about when Jesus would have said this. But the psalmist David is talking, and in this case, we need, to, we need to imagine it as well in our own situations. Because I'm sure there have been nights and times when you've laid on your bed and tears were, were your, were your uh, consumption, technically. It was all you knew was just to seek God and tears pouring down your cheeks. And the agony of that and the hurt of that and not knowing what to do about it. It says, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? So see what's happening? When you go through trouble, there will always be somebody to tell you what's wrong with you. You will have people who will tell you what's wrong with you, what you need to do, how you can fix your problem, what's causing you to have these problems. You know, when, when I was in that, you know, under the teaching of the word of faith, if you didn't get healed, it was always something you didn't do right. You didn't say enough, you didn't pray enough, you didn't, or you had some sin in your life. There was always a reason why you were going through trouble. Because Christians in that movement is not ever supposed to go through trouble. You're not ever supposed to be sick. You're not ever supposed to go through trouble of any kind. That's the way they believe. I'm glad to tell you, I believe in faith, but I believe that it has to be totally focused in Jesus, not in me. And I'm going to tell you one thing. If, if my healing depends on my goodness, then we're in trouble. My healing totally depends on his goodness and his provision. But see, I didn't understand that. I put all of that on me. Have you been there before? How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've been there where you feel like, man, I've I got to do all these things in order to get God to do. So there, there are always these naysayers that want to come around and be sure that you know what's wrong and why you're not seeing God do what, what you think or you're asking him to do. So sometimes it's better not even to tell anybody. 
what you're praying about. Especially people that don't have the right kind of faith. And some of those real religious people are the worst ones. So don't, don't be going around telling some people unless you want to be among those people that are always trying to shoot you or shoot you down in the situation that you're in. So he's saying here, uh, where is thy God? You know, Jesus on the cross, they said to him, you know, where's God? You, if you, you really know him, you should come down off of that cross. He had the naysayers, and you're going to have them too. It amazes me how we get so concerned because some little naysayer comes along. Uh, I was talking to somebody uh, this week, and they said, this person really hurt my feelings because they told me blah, blah, blah. And I said, so uh, excuse me, consider the source and keep your eyes on Jesus and don't worry about, you know, we get to, I, I said this, I said, the people that, that, that bother me when they, when they say ugly things to me is a very small group. There are people out there who might say some, something ugly to you, but you know what? You, they're not worth you listening to their garbage and getting cast down because they have an opinion. Excuse me? Nobody has been given authority over your life to speak into your life and tell you all the things that need to be told. So you need to override some of that junk. You know, there's, uh, uh, it was so funny, you know, to just speak the truth sometimes. When somebody's talking to you, sometimes you just need to speak the truth. There was one politician that was uh, talking to this little girl, 12-year-old girl in her crowd that was, that was wearing one of her hats. And she said to this little girl, 12-year-old girl, said, Oh, I'm so proud of you. Look at you. You're wearing one of my hats. And the little girl just innocently said, Well, your people came along and gave it to me. It's free, so I took it. <laughs> I think but that's a good way. That, that, that politician needed to come down a rung or two, and that little girl did a good job of it. And there's some of these people who call themselves prophets and, and godly, wonderful, above everybody else people. And sometimes you just need to be honest and say, That's a, that's a lie. That's not true. What you're telling me isn't true. I'm not going through that or I'm not going to go through that. You know, just because you're saying it doesn't mean it's true. So sometimes we need to be honest with these people who think they're so great. Just think they're so great. And so he says, uh, when, I re when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in thee. For I had gone with the multitudes. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. He said, I went with them. I remember going to church and having that great joy. But he said, now I pour out my soul to you. For some reason, it seems the psalmist is referring to the fact that maybe there was a reason why he couldn't go to church for a period of time. And how many of you know that when you don't go to church for a period of time, you get really disconnected from the body of Christ? And most of us think we can make it okay, you know. But I'm going to be honest with you. If I have to miss a Wednesday night, which is rare, or a Wednesday night, or one Sunday, I feel like it's an eternity before I get back in the body of Christ. Because it's not just about my relationship with Jesus. You know, people think, oh, if I got a good relationship with Jesus, that's all that matters. It is not just about a good relationship with Jesus. You are required to have a good relationship with his kids. You're required to have a good relationship with the body of Christ. Amen. It's important. It's not optional. Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, I can live for God all by myself. In the first place, that's a lie. You can't. We need each other. Sometimes we need each other just because we need correction. You know, who's going to correct you when you're just home serving God by yourself? You're pretty good. You know, you only got one member in your church. You know. Not, not going, anybody going, going to challenge you very much unless you're like the man that was on the stranded island, you know, when they finally found him. They said, where are these three huts you built? He said, well, this is my house. I live right here. And they said, well, what's that one? They said, well, that's my church. And he said, well, what's that one? He said, well, that's a church I quit. And I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there are people like that. Trust me. So, so maybe there was some reason why that he was not able to be in the house of God. And there are feasible reasons. I don't know about you, but COVID was disastrous. Yes. I mean, COVID was horrible. I thank God for all of you. You were wonderful. You stayed connected. 
Our church stayed connected, and I'm so thankful. It was wonderful. We had a great connection going on during that time, and, and you stayed connected, all of you did, even though we couldn't be together, most of us, most of the time. But you were great. But that was, God knew, you know, God knows the circumstances that we're going through. And he makes up the difference. It's like I've talked to Carolyn before, and she'll say, I haven't had time to put as much time in my study this week. I say, God knows how much time you've got. And he'll make up. Now, if you lay around the house and watch TV all week, and then you try to get up and teach on Wednesday night, then that's different. But if you're busy and you're really doing things that are important that you have to get done, God will make up the difference for, for your study time and getting things ready. So God understands where we are. But the point that I want to make to you here, if we don't stay connected to the body of Christ, and we can, but we're just not doing it. Maybe you got, a little, you know, people get a little offended over some crazy thing. And then they're out of church for a little while. Or maybe for a long time. There are people out there in the city of Natchitoches today that got, got mad at somebody years ago and they still won't go to church. What a shame yes. that is. You are not going, you know, you don't get offended when you go to Burger King. They don't get your order right. You go back again. <laughs> Come on. You don't get offended when you go to work because you got to get your paycheck. You go back again. Amen. The only place we get offended and quit is church. We quit church. They offended me. Well, excuse me. That is wrong. That is immaturity. And it is wrong. I've heard people say, I'm going to quit church, but, I don't wanna, but I'm leaving because I don't want to hurt anybody. Could you say that to, for a few minutes? I don't want you to talk, but I don't you say it in just a minute. Because uh, just a minute, until I get through this section, I'm going to call you up here. Because you're going to have to come up here and talk for the God. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get it listed up here. So I want you to just remember this. And look at what he says. Then he says, oh, my, uh, number six, he says, oh, oh my God, what my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember thee. From the land of Jordan. I'm going to remember thee. Even though my soul is cast down within me, Lord, I'm going to remember thee. And then in verse 8, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night, his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Why am I doing this? Why am I allowed? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why am I allowing myself to get in this position? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why am I cast down? Why am I discouraged? We need to ask ourselves that question before God. What is it, God, that's causing me to be dragged down? You're coming. Back. So uh, he, he's saying, I'm asking this question before God. Lord, what is it? Have you ever felt a little troubled, but you really didn't know Exactly. Couldn't put your finger on what the situation was. Have you ever been there? Yes. And then I get before God and ask this same question. Why, Lord? Why is my soul so cast down? Why am I? You know, God doesn't want us to stay in the valley. He wants to bring us up out of that valley. So... He's saying, I don't want to stay here. I'm, I will say unto God, you are my rock. Even though my attitude, my heart is breaking right now. Many of you have lost loved ones. And you've gone through the agony of losing someone. You've also gone through divorce. That's worse than losing somebody just about. It's horrible. It's agony. And, and nobody wants to go through that unless you're stupid. And there are some stupid people in the world, but nobody in their right mind wants to go through that kind of thing. And so when we go through those things, we have children that disappoint us and, and, and they become rebellious and we feel, we, feel this, we feel like they've just rejected everything we've tried to do. Our heart breaks and we cry. But in the middle of it all, the psalmist is saying here, I will say unto God, you are my rock. I will say you are my rock. I'm, I've got a rock that, you know, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise of God. I will never leave you. So I know that even when I'm going through these things that are difficult, that God will not forsake me. Did you know God won't even forsake you when you fail? He's going to give you time to repent. He's going to call you to repentance. And sometimes the reason we get cast down is because we have sinned. And when we cry out, why am I cast down? Why am I? And God can put his finger on something that's causing that to happen in your life. 
And so then you have to repent and come back to where you are. Verse 10, as with the sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? So here we are again. He's recalling. Um, it keeps on coming. Lord, my enemies keep on, just like Jesus, he, he, so many enemies that came against him. Lord, these people keep on saying these things. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't go out and tell everybody, you know, I'm amazed at how we think we can get some relief by spreading things around. You know, that won't add, that won't bring you relief. It will only add to your agony. Because then you're going to be repeated and people are going to do and say, it's going to add, it's going to pile on. The place you need to go with this kind of situation is to the Lord in prayer. Now, I know there's times we need to go directly to the person when we're dealing with situations we need to deal with. I understand that. But I'm talking about putting mess out on Facebook, putting mess out all over the place, talking to everybody that comes along. You know, we should never talk to people when we're angry. Because then you'll get cast down and say and do things you shouldn't do. So then verse 11 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted? Don't you like that word? Disquieted. It means, it means I don't have any rest. This, this uh, part of me is disquieted. Hope thou in the Lord. This is my answer. For I shall yet praise him who is the, who is the health of of my countenance and my God. He is the, isn't that a good way to say it? He is the health of my countenance. You know, every time we get a compliment on the way we look, it should be because Jesus is shining through us. Because there is joy and there is a, a, an excitement that comes out of us that the world loves. Amen? And then he says at the beginning there of, of Psalm number 43, Judge me, O God. And plead my cause against the ungodly nation. Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust men. Judge me, oh God. You know, that's a good thing. Some people don't think it's a good thing. They don't want, they don't want to be judged by anybody, not even God. But you know, until we're judged by God, we can't be corrected by God. We've got to let him bring us to that place of correction. And that means he has to put his finger on the thing that is a problem in my relationship with him. Because my goal in life, and it should be every child of God's goal in life, is to please the Lord. The Bible says don't be men pleasers, be God pleasers. So if you're worried about being men pleasers, you're going to make some really bad mistakes and errors in your life. You should never, you know, I, I believe that trouble talked about should never be talked about away from the person that the trouble is with. If I've got an attitude about somebody, I should never talk to somebody else about it, nor allow somebody else to talk to me about their attitude about somebody. Unless that person is present. It's wrong. To have to converse against somebody or complain about somebody to a friend when that person is not present. I know that just makes you shout up and down, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> but it's the scripture. It's the word of God. God calls it a backbiter. You say, well, I didn't say anything. I just listened. Well, silence gives consent, as they say. You become a path for that person to be able to unload on you. And sometimes we think, oh, I'm doing a big justice. I'm really helping that person. No, you're letting them dump on you. You're letting them dump on you. That's not right. I don't care who it is. You've got to stop it. You say no. If you got a problem with that person, you go talk to them. Don't talk to me. Because I'm not going to let you dump it on me. I don't care what it is. Don't feel justified and feel like you're God's answer to them. You're not. You're not God's answer to somebody who's offended. Come on. You're not. You're never to listen to somebody's gripe. 
even on your job, you got somebody on your job that wants to complain about the boss, you tell them, I'm not listening to you. Go talk to that boss if you want to talk to anybody, I'll be quiet. Don't talk to me. As a matter of fact, I'll just call him in here right now and we'll solve it. Call him in here right now and we can all talk together since you seem to want to talk to me. Oh, they'll, they'll run and hide like a scalded rat. That's what they'll do because they want to use you. They want, to, they want to jive up your sympathy. People that want to dump on you want to jive up your sympathy. So you're split between people feeling sorry here and feeling this person was wrong and this person's got a grievance and you feel like it's your important for you to carry that for them. But for some reason, I want you to know that is wrong. It's not fair to you and it's not fair to that person. You're teaching them that it's okay to dump. And they need to come face to face with the fact that they're not supposed to be doing that. And the only way they'll do it is when nobody will allow it. So don't talk to me about another person unless they're in the room. You understand me? Sometimes I know you need to come for counsel with a minister when you need to deal with the problem, to get counsel to know how to resolve the problem, but that should strictly be to a pastor or somebody in leadership that is holding that and not using it against that person and not getting a feeling against that person. A person who's truly a minister of the gospel standing as a pastor does not carry a grievance against somebody just because a person comes and tells them they got a problem with that person. You understand? But just a friend or a buddy will take your, will take your cause and get offended with you and get hurt with you and carry your hurt and the next thing you know you're down. So this is a very serious situation. I promise you, you will be sorry if you become, they used to say don't let anybody use you as a garbage can because that's what it is. That's what it is. And you are not their savior. You're not their Holy Ghost. You're not their God. You're not their counselor. He's their counselor. He's their counselor. And they need to go to him. I remember years ago, someone came to me to talk to me about a situation. They started talking and I knew that it was something that I probably didn't need to hear. And I told them, Look, instead of us talking, I want you just to go in there in the church, kneel at the altar, and seek the face of God for a while. After they did that, you know what? They didn't need to talk to me. They didn't need to talk to me. So, judge me, O oh God, because I want my life to please you. That's what it's all about, pleasing you. And plead my cause, because God's the one who will plead your cause. Would you rather have God pleasing your cause or you want to go dump on somebody else and try to get them to plead your cause? If you want to, God ain't going to plead your cause. If that's what you're doing, God won't be pleading your cause. You'll be, you'll be signing up other people to plead your cause. And God will say, well, good luck. Because that's what you're depending on is luck when you're letting somebody else plead your cause. You understand me? Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Have you ever felt like God cast you off? You know, Jesus did that. He said, oh God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? I remember laying in the hospital room the first time I was in the hospital with that disorder. And I remember black, black, blackness blackness. My Bible lay on my shelf beside my bed. I had no desire to pick it up. I was so low. That's how it feels when you start mourning over the fact that things aren't going the way you think they ought to go. And then you end up in that depression and that oppression of the enemy coming against you. But David, David says here, oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let me lead them, let them bring me into thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. What does he want to bring? Thy light and thy truth to bring me into thy holy tabernacle. Everything is solved in the presence of God. Everything. No matter what you're going through in your life, don't seek something else to be your provision. He is your provision. 
Let his light and his truth lead you into the tabernacle of God, living and dwelling in the tabernacle in his presence. And you'll find peace there. Then will I go into the altar of God. I'm going where I need to go. Now I'm going where I need to go. Unto God my exceeding joy, yea, upon the harp, I will praise thee, O God, my God. Why, again, this last verse is the same as it was in the other chapter. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. You know, uh, David, um, um, as far as I know, he's the one who wrote this psalm. You know what he had done? He had lost his, he had not lost his faith. But he lost his song. I preached that message on Taught on Wednesday night about your song. Your song. Your life is a song. And you can hang on to your faith, but you can lose your song. And God doesn't want us to lose our song. That's why we need to protect it. That's why you don't need the dumping on. You don't need the people telling you everything that you need to do that's wrong or right. You don't need those kind of relationships to drag you into that kind of situation. You need to come to the house of the Lord. You need to come with an open and clean mind. You should never come here carrying junk that somebody told you about somebody else that's gonna worship with you. Never. You should come here with a clean heart and a clean mind, loving everybody and, and, and just totally having the right attitude about everybody who's in the house of the Lord. You come that way and seek his face, then you will be delivered and you will not be cast down. But you will truly know what it's like to walk in the freedom. So don't give up. That's what I want to share with you tonight. Don't give up. Keep your face where it's supposed to be. Don't let anybody influence you but Jesus Christ. Don't let people influence you or drag you down. It's all about Jesus Christ. My brother.